Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. We're taking a look in the book of Acts once again, and we've been looking at the missionary journeys of Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas being the son of encouragement, right? So here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're on their missionary journey, uh, and they, they receive opposition as many of us do when we preach the gospel. The more a society turns away from God, the more a society replaces God's law with man's law, the more that society will hate the word of God and those who bring it. Now, granted, the gospel had not yet been preached at Paul's time, and they're introducing something new, but the whole society, even in, the, in Israel, much of the society had a contrary belief. This is why even the Pharisees fought against Paul and Barnabas, uh, because they were introducing something that was not familiar. It was displacing the religious people of his day uh, and kind of taking away from them power and position, they saw that threatened. And that's one of the reasons why they constantly persecute Paul and Barnabas, as well as Peter and others, uh, because the gospel is a message contrary to the ways of the world. And not only is it contrary to the ways of the world, but it condemns the world in many ways and people don't like to be condemned so the gospel message is what condemns people and those who are preaching it will also be hated that's why jesus said if they've hated me they're going to hate you also because a servant is not greater than his master and if they persecuted and killed Jesus, they're going to ultimately do the same to us who preach his gospel. And I don't think many people, or many pastors even, let alone Christian lay people, think about that. We don't really think about being persecuted or killed for our faith, do we? Because in this country, it's not come to that. And that's something we've got to remember. This is not the norm in church history. So we do have to be wary of that. Because the, the hatred is real. And it only increases over time. So remember what I said. The more we, put, we push God out of society, the more society is going to persecute Christians. Is going to come at us first to want to shut us up but then to push us out of society and ultimately they're going to want to beat us down, um, which is the progression that it always takes throughout history. So we're going to begin here. We're going to take a look at, uh, at chapter 14, actually chapter 15, because that's where we're going to go. But we're going we're gonna to finish up here with chapter 14. We're going to look at this ministry that Paul and, uh, and Barnabas have. And we're going to take a, take a journey through Pisidia and Pamphylia. As, and those are the areas that they preach the gospel. So we'll recap a little bit of that. And then we'll jump into chapter 15. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father... Open our hearts and our minds this morning as we take a look at your word and Lord, teach us and teach us to be strong in our faith and to learn the word of God and to not be fearful of what man can do to us, but long, long to win the souls of individuals to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might have everlasting life. Lord, let that be our desire, to love everyone created in the image of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You know, truly, people are created in the image and likeness of God, which is what gives them value and worth and all of these things, which is, it gives them these things. So for us, we are able to, and desire to see good come to people, to be able to love them with a, with a love from God. Um, we're not valuable as human beings because the president says we are, or because a political party says we are, or a government of any kind says we are. Every human being has dignity, value, and worth intrinsic to themselves because it is given to them by their creator. And nobody can take that away. They can cover it up. They can, as Jesus said, they can kill the body, but they can't take the soul. That's God's, and that's God's domain, and that's that's his prerogative. Um... And so the Lord is good and he, he wants us to preach his gospel that people might simply believe and have eternal life. Well, here's Paul and Barnabas and Peter and all the uh, disciples and the apostles and they're doing just that. They're out there preaching the gospel. As we saw, they were going through Pisidia and Pamphylia. We're told in chapter 14, verse 23, um, that there were elders appointed in all of the churches, right? And they, and let's look at verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Pretty simple, right? They, they fasted and prayed and then commended them to the Lord and appointed elders in every church. In verse 24, and after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalia. And then they sailed to Antioch. And from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. So they went back to Antioch after they had preached and faithfully preached the ministry, right? Um, and so... Hopefully, as you read through chapter 14, we saw this work that they had done um, in Iconium and Lystra and all of these other places. You know, let's take a look because I'm wondering here if we need to be reminded again. Um, so Paul and Barnabas go back to Antioch and they rehearse everything that took place in Iconium and Lystra and how they had preached and taught and people were healed and all of these miracles God had done and how the church was growing. Most of all was how it was now being expanded, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So now a, a, a false teaching is coming in. These individuals were known as Judaizers in the early church. And their whole teaching was that not everything from the Jewish religion was to be done away with. In other words, we, we still are to incorporate some of these things into the faith, right? Into the, the new faith that Jesus brought, which isn't really new, right? In one sense, it is. Jesus said a new commandment I give to you, right? And yet he says it's not a new commandment. It's really an old commandment that you love one another, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. God should be primary 
in our life. Our first love should be the Lord God, period. Then come spouses and children and whatever else in this world. But God should be primary. Well, here we have a new teaching that they're bringing in, never taught by the apostles, but some from Judea, certain men were told, came in and were saying, you need to be circumcised. So they're bringing in some of these rituals from, from the old Jewish religion under Moses, circumcision. And they're saying that nah, that has to be done or you're just not going to be saved. I mean, if you, if you don't do that, God's going to reject you. It's almost as if that's what he's going to be looking for, for entrance into heaven. No, <laughs> that's not what he's going to be looking for. True circumcision, even Isaiah and Jeremiah in the Old Testament said true circumcision is circumcision of the heart. It is the, the heart that matters. And I say this over and over in our Bible studies. That God is just is not looking for just outward conformity or what we would call religious people. He's looking for a heart change. He's looking for the circumcision of the heart. Because that's what makes it real. So these individuals are coming in saying, you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. Let's look at verse 2 of chapter 15. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. <clears throat> so everywhere they went now, Paul and Barnabas, they were making sure that they preached the gospel and that everyone knew the Gentiles were saved, were getting saved. They were coming into this entity called the church, um, the kahal in the Old Testament, it's called. It's, it is the gathering together of believers. So the kahal or the church, right? And, and so... When they came to Jerusalem, they were told, maybe you better go to Jerusalem to the apostles and, and everyone there and explain to them this new teaching that's coming and refute it. Since you've already argued with these individuals and you've refuted this teaching of circumcision being necessary for salvation. So they sent them over to Jerusalem, which was the mother church, right? That's where everything began and that's where they went. And so they went to Jerusalem and they began to explain to the apostles and everybody there everything that God had done with them throughout all these areas they visited. Verse 5, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying <clears throat> that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. So now it's in Jerusalem and there are Pharisees who are believers, obviously recent converts, right? But they don't want to do away with everything that they, they did before. And that includes trying to keep the law of Moses and circumcision. And they wanted to put that on new Christians. They wanted to take those requirements and add them to what God is doing through the gospel. You know, there are always people in the church who do this. They want to add new things to requirements to be a Christian. You know, one of them might be, 
you can't have long hair if you're a man. Another one might be, you can't have beards or, you know, you need to, you need to shave all this off. Um, another one could be, you can't wear pants as a female, you must wear a dress. And it has to be a certain length, you know, down to the ankles. Yeah, all of these are requirements of men. They're not requirements of God, per se. And the problem with that is that eventually they become requirements for salvation. And people actually make it such. They, they really do not want to just obey the gospel. What they want is they want to add things to it. And that's what we see happening here with this question of the Judaizers, right? Verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and he said to them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. Now Peter remembers that the Spirit fell upon the Gentiles through his preaching as well. And God put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore... Why do we tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why are we bringing back the law, which we were not even able to keep? It was a heavy burden. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. It's all by grace. Through faith, right? It's not ever by our works. It's just not. I can never earn my salvation through just my works. It's by grace. The grace of God through faith. And we believe. Verse 10. Now therefore, why do we tempt God and put the yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Well, then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring that what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets. Now they're finding that the Gentiles really were promised salvation also. And this was written about in the prophets, their own writings, many, many centuries prior. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and build and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, said the Lord, who does these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. You know, it's a great mystery, but <clears throat> God called it and he said it was going to happen. So God knows that the Gentiles were going to believe. God appointed this. And, and that's, what, that's what they are saying, that this is in your writings. It's in the prophets. God appointed it and it will be done. Verse 19. Therefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles have turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, 
from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time has in every city them which preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then it pleased the, the apostles, and this pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So they took some of these very worthy elders among the brethren there in Jerusalem, and they, they sent them with Barnabas and Paul to Antioch. Verse 23, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So they sent people there who are going to teach them, who are going to encourage them, and set them straight with regard to what the apostles expect and what the apostles actually taught. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled, from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. And then fare ye well, goodbye. So that's kind of the letter, right? Verse 30, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered this epistle, <clears throat> which when they had read it, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren to the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the Lord, the word of the Lord with many others also. So now they're staying there teaching. Um, but I, I notice in verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So even though they only gave them a few things to keep, a few laws to keep, um, don't, you know, eat the blood and things strangled and stay away from fornication and meats offered to idols. Aside from that, no other, no other law are they going to burden them with. And I like the statement where it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So it tells you that any council the church has, any gathering where they're trying to make decisions, they do it through prayer. And they, they do it through prayer and fasting. And they seek sincerely the guidance of the Holy Spirit in making decisions. That truly is what we do. Um, and it needs to be what we do. The church is not a business. That may come as a shock to some people. The church is not a business. It is a mystical entity. It is the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. It's eternal. And it transcends this world. So it's not a worldly organization or a worldly business. And it's unfortunate that there are pastors and bishops and priests and everybody else who, 
and lay people who see it as a business try to introduce, you know, Madison Avenue techniques and business models and all of these things to keep it running. Well, God doesn't have to do that. He created the church. He added to the church daily. He supports the church. And we're told the gates of hell will never prevail over the church. Now, things in the world will. <clears throat> Finances prevail over local congregations. Divisions and fights can also prevail over local congregations. And many of these things, if not all of them, have a spiritual element to them, an attack against Christians in the body of Christ. But the church as a whole will never disappear from the face of the earth. It might seem like it at some point in the future. We're told that Christians will be scattered and the great tribulation and, and apocalypse and all those things when that happens. And it'll seem as if the church has disappeared from the earth. But it, it's gone underground. People meeting in people's homes and being quiet about it because persecution will be ramped up again. All those things we know are coming in the future. It's in the book of Revelation and other passages in scripture that tell us about this. We're not kept in darkness. God has prepared us. He's told us ahead of time. He's told us to watch, which doesn't mean we sit with our nose pressed against the mirror, uh, the window in our living room <laughs> staring outside. It means that we're aware aware that this world is not our home, that we're just passing through, that the church has a mission to do here, but this world isn't the home of the church either. We have a heavenly home, a heavenly kingdom that we are working towards. Um, and that's pretty much where we find ourselves. And so again, you know, the Christians here are, are seeking to teach. You've got Silas who decides he's going to stay with, uh, with Paul and Barnabas in Antioch and continue teaching, which isn't a bad thing. That's a good thing. So Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So there's a lot of teachers there was a lot of people teaching and, and preaching at this time. Look at verse 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take, them, take him with them who departed from them in Pamphylia and did not continue with them in the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they depart departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So apparently there was an argument and a fight between Mark and Paul. Mark left them when they were in Pamphylia, just up and left them and went back to Jerusalem and Antioch. Uh, Barnabas wanted to bring him, but the argument was so bad between Paul and Barnabas with regard to Mark that Barnabas decided he would just go with Mark and he went and visited Cyprus, where they were going to confirm the churches, see how they're doing, preach the word of God. And Paul took Silas, and Silas being commended by God from the brethren, Paul took Silas, and he went to Syria and Cilicia, and they were teaching and confirming the churches. This is the second missionary journey. 
And this is where Paul is once again going and, and not only establishing churches, but he's really confirming the churches that he established the first time. And so that brings us to the end of chapter 15. And when we get into chapter 16, Paul is going to find one of my favorite disciples, Timothy. The word Timothy means, the name Timothy means honoring God. So Paul is going to, to find Timothy and Timothy is going to have a mission, a mission to do and would later receive two epistles, two letters from Paul. And uh, we've already been through those, but at some point in the future, we'll go through them again. Well, read ahead chapter 16, and we will we'll jump in there next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing us the humanity of Paul and Barnabas, how even these men of God who were filled with the Holy Spirit could disagree and even argue over one John Mark. And so, Lord, it helps us to know that they were human like we are. And yet, divisions are never a good thing in the body of Christ. And, and if we've had an argument or a fight with anybody in our lives and we have yet to, to forgive them, Lord, I pray we would do that today. Forgive those you're angry with those who've hurt you, those who have betrayed you. Lord, we forgive them from our hearts and we ask you would bring healing into their lives and ours. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Read ahead chapter 16 and I will see you tomorrow.